Greetings, Tom Matuska here for the Matuska Taxidermy Supply Company, Thursday Afternoon Live with Brett Wingfield. And we'd like to welcome our, our audience, our viewing audience. And uh, if you've joined us for the last, I think four, are we on five? Um, the last four, we, this is our walleye project and we're starting a walleye from, we started a walleye from start to finish. And in the first session, if you go back in the archives or in our YouTube videos, uh, we showed you how to make a pattern because you have to make a very exact replica of the body to fill out the skin so we don't have wrinkles and we don't have overlaps and giving the customer back exactly what he brought in. Um, we try to make the same length, we try to make the same girth, we try to make the um, same body shape whether he's spawning or whatever he happens to be. So that all starts with, with uh, patterning the fish and taking real accurate measurements and that's how we started with this. Yep, put back what you take out. Jim Kimball says, put exactly <laughs> back what you took out. Um, and then we uh, showed you in, the, in probably the next section, we showed you how to purchase a commercial body. And this is a uh, fish on fish form, very, very accurate walleye body. And this, this is a head, it's an S swimming curve. They come in different, different suppliers will have different poses. This can be used like this. It can be used like this. Um, the way we fasten our fish to the, to the driftwoods or whatever we're going to put them on, we can angle them down. We can bring them out. We can kind of change the pose and they're still going to be very, very sturdy. And we'll show you how to do that later. Um, then we also showed you how to carve a body. Um, carve a body is probably the most versatile way um, to mount a fish because you're in control of how much curve, you know, um, how much of an S curve, how much of a C curve, whatever he happens to be. You can have him, um, you know, whoops, deal. Uh, <laughs> so um, lifelike. <laughs> you can have him, uh, you know, jumping up. You can have his mouth, you know, really wide open. You can have his mouth closed where sometimes the the bottom bodies you have to alter. And then last week we showed you a few extras. When we skin the fish, um, I actually cut out the roof of the mouth and the floor of the mouth and his esophagus and we built um, a little throat in there. And that way you can, um, ooh, look at, eyes, nose and ear specialist. <laughs> um, and that way you can cut that out and save yourself a whole lot of you know, organic tissue in there that's gonna attract bugs and smells and things like that. And when you look down the throat, when the customer looks down, he's gonna see something that looks somewhat natural. Yep. And then just for cosmetics, um, you can use the real gills. You can cut your gills out. You can close your, close your gills. Um, we made a little one out of uh, Fix-It Sculpt, I think, that you can actually put right in as the First gill, you can make you know four of them if you want to, but usually one or two um, is pretty convincing. Yep. Better than the real gill. They will look real nice compared to the real gill. So this one's gonna have, our walleye has gills and it has a throat also. But if you've never carved a fish body before, um, give it a try and don't settle for something less than what you think yeah. is a perfect fit. Um, foam is not expensive, and if uh, um, you carve a body that doesn't look like the species that you're attempting to mount, don't be afraid to carve another one. You know, there's, yeah. you can still use this for whoops, smaller fish, you can do it for rocks, you can do it for habitat, um, the chunks of foam, but don't be afraid to carve another one. We always tell students, your first body, you're doing a largemouth bass, it might look like a walleye we'll have you carve another one. Um, next one might look like a boogie. We'll have you carve another one. Um, don't be afraid to practice, practice, practice. You are a sculptor just like Michelangelo. Exactly, but he did not use foam, he used marble. You're using something a little bit easier. Uh, you're still teaching yourself and training yourself the principles of sculpting. And with the measurements, you're gonna have the widths, circumferences, heights. And if they don't start skinning, until their body is done, you have the real fish right here to refer back to as shapes and curves and contours. That's an excellent point. 
Um, if you measure the fish, set the pattern away, and then skin the fish, carve the body later, um, you, you do not have that fish to look at. Um, what you noticed when I skinned the fish, we had the, or when we built the body, I had the fish laying there, and I think you were carving the body, and you could caliper right off of the fish. So that's a good way to do it. Okay, um, with that, we're going to try to cover a whole lot today, and so we have to work fast. I don't know, sometimes my mouth gets in the way of how much we're going to get done. Um, but I think we're going to have Brett take the fish skin, and just a quick recap on preserving that fish skin. Our method, and I told you at the end of the session last week, is, um, for instance, a five-gallon bucket of salt. We put in probably a half, a, or I mean, five-gallon bucket of water. We put in a half a pound, half a cup of salt. They're going to be really confused. <laughs> half a cup of salt, half a cup of borax, um, a splash of X effect. That's our bactericide that we love in the shop. It keeps everything clean. It keeps odors down keeps mildew bacteria from growing. It's called X-Effect, it's very inexpensive. It goes in all of our um, tanning pickles and tans and fish pickles, bird soaks, everything, X-Effect. And uh, then um, we put in Protex Pre-Soak because that is our bug proofer. And I put in a quarter cup of Protex Pre-Soak and that will protect your skin from bugs. Leave it in there, um, small fish, half hour. This walleye, an hour would be good. Larger the fish, the longer we leave them in. We're careful on muskies and northerns because they have a epidermis over their scales and they can actually get water blisters that we have to worry about hurting the cosmetics of the fish. So um, those fish, we minimize the soak. And the reason we know they're done or how we can tell they're done is we, low, we look at their gills. And if their gills have turned a nice, um, what would you call, beigey, peachy color, um, they're not looking vibrant red or brown anymore. Um, the pickle is doing its job. So with that, we have pickled this walleye, and um, we're going to have Brett assemble it. And while he's doing that, sewing, um, I'm going to show you how to put a rod in. So we're going to go backwards just a little bit, because we do put the rod in ahead of time, and um, show you how to put the rod in and talk about painting the body. You'll notice that body is painted and we'll discuss that a little bit. And then we're gonna try to um, spread the fins and, and into a natural pose too. We gotta hurry. I go, um, go. Do you wanna show them the rod first so they know um, what you're talking about? This is the about? rod and this is six gauge, right? Um, this I is a so, very yeah. heavy um, uh, galvanized rod and you put, they're a little difficult to work with, but we're not gonna bend it a great deal. And we're gonna put this probably on a piece of driftwood. And when that's in place, you can actually position the fish up straight or down and bend it the way you want to. And if it's fastened inside of the fish, which we're gonna show you later, um, you won't hurt the body and it's adjustable. And when people slam the doors or walk across the room, your fish won't wobble if the wire is heavy enough. Ideally. Ideally. Here, we'll get rid of this. Okay, so we're gonna watch you. I'll put this over here. Got that? Well, I'll need it here shortly. Um, so we're just gonna get him in there, put him on. I think so. All right. Um, you can see the fish is all skinned now. He's um, fin butts are are nice and short. We've got everything out of the tail, everything out of the body. He has actually been pickled and rinsed very good. The rinse is very important. Um, there are oh salt racks and so forth. If you don't get that rinsed off the surface, you can get a little bit of crystallization if they dry. Um, put a little bit of that on it. But we're going to use just a little bit of fish clay. Um, would you call this a uh, stoneware type clay? Um, it's, it's porcelain and uh, it's actually a potter's clay, but it's white. And we've used dark clays before. And when we use them in the cheeks, they dry dark and they darken up your face. So we lean towards um, the, we call it fish clay, but it's an, a porcelain potter's clay. Yeah. Um, and it, the other nice thing is it's, it's very soft. When it dries, it's easy to get out of the cheeks, too. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm going to put just a little tiny roll of that at the base of the fin, at the base of the tail. 
just to take up a little bit of that space between where the cartilage stops and starts and the uh, foam, the union between the foam and the cartilage of the tail. And probably worth saying this fish has been test fit a few mm -hmm. times so we know he fits. Um, and uh, I'm gonna put a little bit in the head, just a little bit. I think this is important. Um, we got that little bit there um, that Kate's showing you in the tail. Very, very, very small amount. Less than a pencil diameter, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, um, yep, and I would say significantly less. The, the tough part here is if, if you carved your fin bases onto your body, um, including the tail, and then you put a great big roll of clay at, in the tail, you're going to have a real tough time getting that fit. And uh, I think we'll show Caitlin kind of what we're talking about. If we, right here, we, we went to a lot of effort to carve this accurately, this tail shape, but if we put another thickness of clay in there, um, it would hold all of that out. So. Um, we're going to do that and make your fish longer than what he's supposed to be. Yeah, and and we'll show you what that would do too. That'll really mess with your fit. Um, so I'm going to take a small amount here, and I'm going to put this up inside the brain cavity. I'm going to turn this cake so maybe they can see it. Um, and all I'm going to do here is I'm going to put just a little bit at the base of the skull. I'm not gonna fill this pocket. I'm not gonna put very much in here. Again, all I'm trying to do is get a little bit of transition mm -hmm. between the cartilage of the skull and the, the foam mannequin. I'm just trying to make a little blend to that union. I'm not trying, not going to any effort to fill that whole void. We'll work, about, we'll work on that later. Um, and then I'm gonna put some clay in cheeks. So we've got the cheeks are all clean. Worth noting here you can see my finger through through the skin and we're going to um, we're go going to make sure and fill that void as well all through here and we're not going to overbuild uh, that cheek. So I've got oh a pretty good amount there. If you imagine how much material you took out, that's what we're going to put back. The thickness of it is, is fairly thin. I'm just going to put that in through the eye socket. And on a walleye, the skin in the cheek is very, very thin and you can actually see it going in there. Um, I'm going to take a pin. One other good note. Who showed me this? Did you show me this? I bet you did. Um, to take a pin at the back side of the cheek. <coughs> right back there. Mm -hmm. Did you show me that? Um, <laughs> we're going to let a Maybe. little bit of air escape from that. And, and any moisture, um, any water that might be in there, we can push out through that. And one of the, that's a bad area of shrinkage for a lot of people doing skins, you'll see right where this cartilage meets the, the meat, there'll be a lot of shrinkage there. And I think that's because you get either a buildup of meat, a buildup of air, or a buildup of water in that void. And then when the fish dries, it, uh, it shrinks up and then you have problems with that at that union. So I'm going to put just a little bit more in here. The better job you do now, like, like you're saying, by getting your water out, make sure you get all the meat out, that's going to save you finish work in the end. Because if you Boy. have dips and, and bumps and things like that, um, they have to be filled and textured and painted. Um, whereas if you do a good job, as you were saying, um, you don't have to do any of those fix-its. Yeah. And um, another, another good point I think you mentioned when we were making our pattern um, we talked about taking the width um, between the eyes at the bottom of the cheek and that's a that's a good a good point now to to look at we don't want to overfill these cheeks and cause this to puff way out um, we want to keep that fairly narrow um, because that will affect your eye set later on so um, 
working kind of quickly here to, in the interest of time. I think you're going to get him done. I don't know. i got to go fast. By next week. <laughs> <laughs> By episode seven. Um, so that side is ready. I'm going to flip him over quick. We'll do the other side. Um, and do you have anything fun to tell him while I'm doing um, that? While you're doing that, always keep your fins oh, wet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you notice Brett has a spray bottle over there with a little bit of uh, our X-Effect bactericide. Um, and water, and we just have that around the shop all the time. It's good for any kind of hides. You don't have to worry about bacteria growing, but it keeps those fins moist. And if, if this fin dries out and it's stuck on the table and you move the fish, um, you're gonna tear the little webbing between the rays. So keep your fish fins wet. Um, we have even, for competition purposes, cut the fins off, right? Mm -hmm. um, I like to do and that. That's, uh, try that sometime if you get perfect fins and you want to do an exceptional job like for competition purposes remove your fins not the scaled skin just the fins um, and spread them separately onto your body that's another thing you'll see um, yep. people do and the fins come out exceptionally neat because they haven't been flopped around on the table and you can keep this really pretty rays um, really nice and full with the webbing in between um, so take care of your fins. A lot of people use artificial fins. Mm -hmm. A lot of people use artificial heads. If you were wanted to go that route, I would fit those to your body before the skin is ever put on, remove them, mount your fish skin, and slide the parts on to marry together with the fish skin. Yeah. All right, Kate, we're going to now back up just a little bit so we can show them the whole skin. And we're going to put glue on. Um, what are we going to use for glue? There's all kinds of glues out there. What, what's the best one for fish? There's a lot of good glues out there that we've used. Um, one that is always readily available in our shop and that we like to use is acrylic caulk. This, this is DAP acrylic caulk um, that you can get almost anywhere. And acrylic is basically a water base. Clean up with water. Mix it with water, thin it with water, and you want it the thickness of, what would you say, pudding, soft pudding? Yeah, I would say pretty runny, soft pudding. We don't yeah. want it to go on like thin, thin paint that would take three or four coats. We want it somewhat thick, but we don't want to build up either. We want it to level out really, really nice. So I would say soft pudding. Yeah. So that's been thinned out. We've already got this ready. It was just injected into the cup from the caulk tube. You did that an hour ago, I suppose. Yep. Um, and so now we're just going to coat the show side of this fish, um, the skin, with a th thin layer, but like you said, enough that it's not going to um, be completely absorbed into the body. And um, the paint that you're going to show them in a little bit helps seal that body so it doesn't, um, we don't lose quite as much of this glue into the foam. Um, but then I'm going to come around the top and probably go down halfway around the seam on the backside, um, just because we're going to sew this skin into place and we don't want to be sewing through a whole bunch of glue. Um, so we're going to leave just a little bit and by the time this glue all migrates and gravity will pull it around, it'll be just fine. But um, So the object is, is to get your fish skin glued really nicely to the body. The more you put on and the closer to the edges you get, the more you're going to get on your hands and on your clothes and everywhere else. And then you're going to have to clean it up. Then you're so going to have that's it on the, the only drawback. Yeah. Uh, the best thing of that is it is water cleanup. If you get it where you don't want it, um, get it off right away. We even take our yeah. fish over to the sink sometimes and spray them after they're mounted before they're posed. Yeah. Um, and now I am going to slide the body. Kate, you might want to show them. Just a little, from a little further back. Um, yeah. Is this your test fit? And yeah, if it was, <laughs> you better make sure you're a good carver. Um, fortunately, I think we know this one's going to fit. I hope. I hope it fits. It's going to fit, isn't it? Um, and, Nobody's uh, going to fit before you get to this stage. Yes. It'll make life much easier. Um, and we have gotten a little overconfident and shorted ourselves in the test fit process. A time or two? Maybe I have. I have. I don't, you probably never have, but I have. 
Um, and I'm just going to anchor anchor this. And, and again, I think something that if we haven't said it yet, you're going to hear a hundred more times. Um, pin the things that you know into the positions that you know you can lock in for sure. And the two most critical are the tail and the head. So if you get the tail pinned in place first, or the head, um, then come forward and lock in your head, everything else will fit in between. We'll get those in place. But right now we wanna make sure we have the head in place and the tail in place. And one good way to know that if you remember way back to the first one, those of you that were watching, um, we borrowed that little tip from Tim about leaving that shelf that we put the head up on. Um, we left. That'd be like right here. Yep. And, and we marked the length of that head and that head union, that little shelf will go to the center line of the eye. So if you have your head positioned correctly, if you have the skin in place correctly, that little point will come all the way forward and you'll see it through the eye orbit. Now I, my clay that I put in the cheeks is kind of pushing out here, so I'm gonna close that up. and Just wiggle it on a little bit more. I've got a little bit of a step right where the head union is. I'm gonna put a little bit of clay at that point just to fill that out a little bit better than it is. And then um, I think we're ready to go, I think. I'll start pinning everything else in between. Now Brett's pretty experienced and you can see him handling this fish. Um, he knows where to grab and where to push and what he can get away with. Um, those of you beginners, especially if you're using a uh, body that you carve, that throat latch and the tail and the extension yes. on the head that goes up into the brain cavity can be very fragile. And, very, very good And point. when you're first starting out carving your own bodies, more than one time you will hear a crack and you broke the tail or you broke the throat latch. Um, don't despair, put it back together. You can put them back together. Yeah. And we've had real good luck with uh, Gorilla Glue, right? Yeah, yeah. It does a great job of putting styrofoam back together. Um, it, it really does. It's a urethane glue itself and so that does good. Um, one thing quick here, I'm just going to bring this cleathrum bone that we carved out, that nice little shelf Tom carved for, for that to lay in, sits really nicely there. And now I'm just going to go down the length of the body and make sure that I've got the fins up on center, the leading edge of the dorsal. We have a little bit of a accommodation for that soft dorsal, so I'm going to put that where it goes on the center. And then I'm gonna come under here and make sure the spiny dorsal's on center. Put a pin in the leading edge of that. And you can see we're pretty close. You must have really done some extra stuff when I was in Texas, because this fits <laughs> really nice. That's really nice. Wow. And, and worth saying too, if this wasn't, if we were a half inch from touching, we'd probably be comfortable that, with that, wouldn't you? Um, um, if it were to overlap, I get panicky and I will probably carve a new body. Mm -hmm. um, I would never, never short a person the fish that he caught. Um, if there is a small gap like that, it's easier to um, fix the seam rather than if it's too tight and uh, the difference between a little quarter inch gap or half inch gap um, in the circumference is negligible. And I think we've got a pretty good start there. Now I'm gonna put this towel under him on the show side. Actually, if we wanna show him, I guess I can show him that. That's pretty much ready to go. And I'm gonna put the towel under just for support and then we'll start sewing him up. If there's much something. of a curve, you can break him that way yeah. also. Yeah. I think he's ready to go. Okay. That's pretty um, nice. Give him an idea of needle and thread, and oh, then yeah. I will show him how to put a 
right in. Um, I think one of the biggest difference makers in sewing up a fish is fire thread. Everything else seems to fray a little bit. Whoops, over there, over here, over there. Um, <laughs> um, it, we really, really like it, have used it for years. And um, it, I have a pretty heavy thread here. This is 20 pound. Um, and the reason is the heavier the thread, the less likely it is to cut through the skin as we pull tight. Fish skin doesn't have a lot of strength to actually break the thread, so you could get away with much lighter. But because this is this heavier diameter, um, won't cut through as I'm sewing. So I've got an edge needle here, and probably a little bit on the small side. Um, I've seen needles that are great big things, they look like big pieces of wire, to more, I think you like to sew with more of a I can get a four grip, to six. Grip yeah. On it, yeah. Um, and again, the, the needle diameter really isn't going to have an ill effect on the back, so you can get away with a fairly good size needle on the back side. Um, and then we're just going to sew, I like to sew up under the scales, so I'm going to sew a simple baseball stitch um, right up under like that. I've got a knot on the base, so I'm going to pull to the knot. And for some reason, I start the first three or four stitches from the underside. I don't know why I've done it this way forever. But by work? the time I get, eh, maybe. <laughs> um, by the time I get four or five stitches, these scales get a little bit bigger. And then I'll start going from the um, outside in. But the, while these scales are short or, or thin um, toward the back portion of toward the tail, I do the first half dozen stitches um, from the outside in, and then I'll turn and go from the, um, or I should say from the inside out, and then I'll do the outside in. And don't try to poke through those scales. Um, right. You'll wear yourself out by the time you get to the head. Go, and that's, yeah, that's, them. I'll show them. Um, I think I can show you pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna turn here. going to be just back a little ways right here okay there we go and then I'm going to go from I'm going to go up under the scale like this and down through um, I'm going to get rid of these couple pins because I'm already anchored in there and I don't like them to interfere with my thread going to come up under like so and watch your tail another good tip um, is to take another towel I'm going to use the same one but to cover the back side where you've already sewn with your towel and that way your thread isn't going to catch your pins or catch on your fins on your tail so just cover that up and your thread will go right over that and now you're skipping quite a distance between stitches. It's not like sewing up a deer tape where you want them, you know, three or an inch apart. Yeah. Um, and with these warm water fish, you can do that bigger scaled fish that hold their shape naturally. I would say, what do you think on cold water fish? What do we sew those? Well, we sew them pretty close. Pretty tight. And there again, it um, depends on what kind of mount it's going to be. If it's going to be, um, you know, on a wall mounting against a wall where it doesn't show um, but trout tend to wrinkle if you don't um, keep your stitches pretty close. Yeah. But I'm just going to keep going. Okay, you keep um, going. So down we'll... this line, do you have, you want to show them your rod now? Sure. Okay, we, uh, we put the rod system in just about all of our fish, um, unless it's a, a pedestal mount usually. And um, it'll be a rod like like this, and this is, um, I went smaller on the bass that I'm gonna do, and this is an eight gauge, and um, it's a kneeled wire, there's two kinds, there's a kneeled and galvanized, and uh, the galvanized tends to be a little bit um, stiffer, and the kneeled bends a little bit, doesn't have the memory, they both work pretty well. So, um, like on the walleye, 
Brett test fit that walleye before we put the rod in, and he just made little lines to where the skin came together. So between his little lines, I would like that rod to come out, and so we put a little dot right in the middle of the fish, knowing that you're gonna have three inches of tail over here and three inches of head over here. You could, you could have that wire come out anywhere. You could have it come out on the head, you could have it come out on the tail. Sometimes when we do school mounts where you're gonna have three or four fish and you don't have a branch that's gonna fit in the middle of that fish, don't be afraid to you know, put it in the head or put it way down in the tail. Um, you can really impress people by having them say, how is he connected? They can't see how he's connected when, he's, when it's way up here wherever that's touching your rocks or your wood. So I want to make a cavity in here to receive my, my wire, and I bent a pretty good L on my wire, kind of like so, and I sharpen it because I'm going to poke it into the foam, and it's going to go right in here. I'll probably run it backwards. And to start with, I just take a spade bit, and on this bass, on the walleye, I used a rather large one, like three quarters inch. This one is a five eighths. And I'm first holding my hand on the show side of the fish because the thing you don't want to do is run this all the way through. I'm going to go very slow in the middle of the fish or where I think I want to have the wire come out. I'm going to go very slow. And I'm going to want to go now this, these spade bits have a little point on them, so I know my hand is there. I would feel that before it pokes through the show side of the fish. Now that I made a hole, I'm going to run it this direction and make a cavity. This is kind of scary to do on live <laughs> TV. Nah. I just chipped out a little chunk of foam there. That doesn't bother me. Now I'm going to also, I've got a pretty good trench going down here now. I'm going to do a cross. I'm going to do a little one that way, that way, and this way. And that's just going to fill with, we're going to fill it with um, Bondo. To hold my wire in place. So all I'm trying to do is make a cavity under the skin of the foam. Being careful not to come out the show side. Now I'm going to knock all the foam out. And you can take an air compressor if you like. I think I'll run over and spray it out with air. Now I've got a pretty good trench going in the back, trench going in the front. Um, that will allow me to put significant amount of auto body putty in it. And I'm going to make sure that my rod will fit. And because I sharpen it, I can force it into place. And so this is how it's going to be. And I'm going to take it out while I put my, my putty in. And this is auto body putty. Um, we just we use a lot of it in the shop. And I thinned it. Auto body putty right out of the can um, typically isn't thin enough to pour, so I added polyester resin. We add a lot of polyester resin to our auto body putty to thin it. Um, we're still only going to use the one catalyst. We're going to use the cream hardener catalyst. Doesn't matter what color. And Anytime you put polyester resin into auto body putty, um, it slows down the set time. So I'm going to put in a little extra hardener. The directions on the can will say um, one inch per golf ball size. Um, I probably put in four. Make sure that you mix it real well. 
Whoa. You're a machine. I'm done. You better hurry. Um, I'm only bleeding a little bit. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> you said. Okay, now I'm going to pour the auto body putty into the cavity. I got a bunch in there. I'm going to take, we just use these big mixing sticks and I'm going to force it into those little tunnels that I made. Then I'm going to take my wire, I'm going to stick it into the body. And I'll usually take some of these just to hold it into place. Now, there's one, one little secret. I will let this set up, but I do not, I do not wanna have to grind auto body putty. So I'm gonna <laughs> ask you to watch this. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> and as soon as that gels, we're just gonna take a, a nice sharp knife and we're gonna slice it off, maybe take a rasp and smooth it to the body. And that will give you a really, really nice support rod that you can attach to driftwood. We attach it to panels if we ever put them on a panel. Um, even just a hanger, you can use that for a hanger. So it works quite well. Yep. Um, I've got one thing to show them. Do it. Okay, right up here. Um, I finished this off, got all the way to the gill cover. And I've rather than tie a knot and run the, run the knot down, I just took this last T-pin here at the head, wrapped two times around the T-pin, and then I put a quick hitch around the T-pin, like that, and then I'm just gonna push the T-pin in. We'll cut that off later, but we'll just let it dry like it is. Um, and he is all sewn up and ready for fins. Almost with ya. Um, we are going to take him and Next thing, we will bring them over here and we're gonna slide this rod onto a little support that we've made. Um, and we do most of our fish this way on, the, on a um, little wooden support. Um, and we're gonna take the rod, we put the rod through a piece of two by two, like so, and then we're gonna bend that down. Um, I, if you can show them, Kate. We're gonna bend this rod down, like so. And then, ready? Yeah, we'll put a couple screws. Tom's gonna put a screw on either side of that rod. Now this is a great way of attaching birds to driftwood or fish to driftwood. We're just nothing more than putting a screw on each side of the rod. And as you tighten one screw, as the head comes in contact with the wire, it pushes it over to the next screw and you just keep going back and forth. If you want to, you can add a third. Now, if we are attaching a drift uh, fish to a piece of wood, like driftwood, and I always refer to wood as driftwood because it always used to be driftwood. Now it's just your habitat piece, whatever it happens to be. Um, we will usually take a spade bit and make a trench in the back and do this whole system, cut our wire off because you won't need so much. And then we auto body putty over it, rasp it down, um, and it's hid. Works really, really well. 
Um, these temporary stands are kind of nice uh, for the time being, and we'll dry them on this, and then we can do all of our finish work here without getting anything on that habitat piece. You wouldn't want to um, do or anything, any of your epoxies, so these temporary stands work really good. Um, he's up now. A um, little bit of head transition. We want to push some, move some clay around a little. Um, notice his cheeks aren't overwhelmingly um, flared wide. Kind of bring those eye orbits together. We're going to open his mouth so that the bottom of his throat meets the throat latch here, the bottom of his tongue. And, um, you've got some rods cut. Do you want to put a okay. rod in there? Show now, that. as you're working with the fish, um, doesn't matter what fish typically. One of the biggest things I see is people allow this head to fall off of mm -hmm. the pedestal that you carved. Um, that happens just in the sewing process. It happens in the, in the mounting process. It just happens drying even, you know. You come in in the morning, looks real good, come in in the morning and it fell down. Um, I can't have that happen. So this is nothing more than a wire, probably about a, oh, maybe a 12 gauge wire. And I'm gonna stick it through the roof of his mouth, way up in the top, rest it against the top of his mouth, make sure everything's aligned here. And I'm gonna stick it. And where I put that rod was, oops, I better use my other, here, I'm gonna let you hold yeah, that one. I think that one's gonna <laughs> we'll be really forget it. cut soon. Um, put that rod right into this carved portion here and stuck it in there. I can pull it out and move it, but now I want to see, make sure that the whole head has a real nice transition this direction. Okay, now that's not enough for me. Um, I also, do you have your pin box over there? Mm -hmm. I like to take it's a little bit of overkill. Um, I like to take these upholstery pins and I'm going to stick one right in here to hold that in place because even though you have that rod there, that can still get worked off and you might not notice it. And this will hold everything in alignment. Now it's up in the head portion so the holes are not going to bother you. Now, most of our customers, um, when they come in, I've never had a customer come in and say, I want the mouth closed. I can never remember a customer saying the mouth closed. And, and I have people said, oh, I want the mouth open. I wanted to see his teeth, all different kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Fish look very nice, not gaping open. I always say it makes them look slow if they're pushing a big 55-gallon drum in yeah. front of them. Um, so most of our customers, we call it moderate. Mouth and gills, moderate. Um, I have another wire lighter than this one. I'm, you do not want to bend this mouth like that. You don't want this big angle right here. It's kind of like when a fish feeds, um, typically they'll pop their mouth open, um, like a bass, for instance, not so much the big predators, but they'll pop their mouth open, create a vacuum and suck things in. If their tongue's sticking up like that, they're mm -hmm. gonna push their little food source out of the way. Um, I'm gonna stick this wire in front of the tongue, on the tongue, and I'm going to attempt to go down into that little throat latch. That might be a little hard to do. Come here, baby. Very sharp teeth. <laughs> Are you bleeding too? Nope. Yeah. Maybe. There we go. Sounded like you got it. Okay, now that, nice. that gives me, that holds this straight and you don't get that hinge jaw effect. Um, so for right now, I think we'll go with that. I may move it a little bit later, but to keep going here. All right, then. The next thing we want to do is spread the fins. And here's where I always tell people, um, if you mount a fish in a real natural position, sometimes customers would not oh, appreciate yeah. that. 
Um, I watch walleyes in the camera a lot of times, and you'll see this dorsal fin laying down. Sometimes you'll see it really erect, but it'll be laying down like that. If you have this fish chasing um, a couple minnows, his tail is going to be spread for thrust. Um, some of these fins are going to be laid flat for streamlineness. Um, his pectoral fins are going to be used for steering. So they can sometimes create an effect that customers aren't used to. Um, I always say fish fins are a little bit like butterfly wings. They're the prettiest when they're erect, you know, yeah. like a, a crappie or something yeah. like that. So that's kind of up to you what you want to do with the fins. Um, would you give me a spray bottle? And I always want to keep these fins moist. And I always have them dripping water as I'm going. Um, you'll keep your fish, you go ahead and spray the side of your fish. You keep him cleaner, there'll be a time to dry him off, but not now. Okay, then, the system that we use, we use a whole lot of um, plastic carding material, and we have two types that we use. This is a plastic sheet, polyethylene, I think so. Maybe, yeah. Probably I might somebody. Have made, I might have made that up. It's probably somebody, yeah. Um, and then the other one is going to be perforated. And our idea is that allows the air to get through and dry. Mm -hmm. So one's perforated, one's solid to pin to. We cut these out in the shape of the fish fins. Like this would be his, somewhere I'd have his tail. This would be his tail. I've already got paper clips all the way around here. Um, from the last time we used these. We never throw these away. We use them over and over and over. And when we're done, these get taken off the fish. They go back into a bag. They go into a tub like this that says walleye fin carding. We open up the walleye fin carding when it's time to do fish, and here is a bag of eight-pound walleye. Fins. Yep. Is that not clever? That way we've got the whole set right there. We don't have to cut them out. 31 inch walleye set right here. Yeah. All right, we have a question from Randy Neese on YouTube and Randy is wondering how you keep the head from sitting when it dries. He says he always put pins in roof of mouth and bottom of mouth, but a lot of times when it dries, the head shifts where the throat latch has shifted, is shifting. We pin a lot. We pin a lot, and I think if you're accurately carved and you have that shelf on the top of your head and use your clay to push that in, get it properly seated, um, we really don't see it moving very much. I think the clay is taking that up, your glue is taking that up. Um, I would say um, the pins that Tom showed you are strategically placed for stability, and if you pin through the roof of the mouth, that's really gonna help support the whole head. Um, you have a way with words. <laughs> Which way? Strategic for stability. <laughs> it makes me feel really technical here. I'm okay. Now, all I did was take the, I put the solid piece on the bottom, and you can pin it with pins first. And then I take the um, perforated one on the front. You could switch them around. You don't have to. And I would like a nice spread on my tail. And I tend to pin them heavy. Um, trout and salmon have a super amount of power in their cartilage in their tail and they, they can warp pretty bad. Um, once they're warped, they're a little hard to straighten out. Okay, now let me look at that. Now the, my tail is I've got it nice and spread, spread the way I want it. And I like, I like to spread my tails. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, but now I just have a floppy old tail there. So I would like to make sure that's not going to move on me. And I'm going to take some of these Europe pins. You can keep asking, Caitlin. I'll go All right. You. Bob Jewelson is wondering, if you don't have the carding cut for the fin, how do you start to do that? 
if you don't have them cut? Correct. Um, we use the fin for a pattern, I'd say, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Um, just You can lay your carding um, in sheet form right up against the tail. Lay that tail right on there. And we cut, what, do you, what would you say, a half inch bigger all the way around, which gives you a little bit. You can see Tom's got a little bit of edging right there. Um, you've got plenty of room around the perimeter. You don't want to get it uh, too wide because your paper clips won't hold tight if your paper clips are, are being restricted um, by much more than this, they're not going to hold up against the fin. So you want to be fairly close to the, to the shape of the fin um, and then just go around the perimeter of the fish and do all of them. Um, now I've got my, my tail carding is, is warped on the tail itself, but the tail spread looks decent. So I'm going to leave it for right now. Um, if you weren't all watching me, I would probably come back and do it over. And I may later. I mean, now you're doing the soft dorsal the same way? Yes. Now, something also to pay attention to is typically, the, I call it the trailing edge. There's mm -hmm. probably a better word for it. But this edge of the anal fin and the soft dorsal typically won't, there won't be this big V up here. This trails much tighter to the body. Did I say that right? Um, so right up here, I would like that tight, tight to the body. And even if you get it tight to the body, um, fish shrink. Fish shrink a lot. Not so much the body size, but you'll notice that fins tend to pull away from where they were placed. So I like to get those nice and tight to the body. And you're not going to hurt anything with paper clips. The more paper clips, the better. Uh, be careful with that. We have used screen in the past, and we've used coarse nylon um, sheets in the past, and at least imprint on the fins. Um, this stuff that we have is like um, the best. Pop box cardboard, I've seen oh, we that stuck. stick to it. And we used to wax it. Orange crush. We yeah, had orange we've crush had on the back of orange. our fins we couldn't get off. Um, yes, Caitlin. Ronnie Elvis is wondering if you recommend perforated carding to allow the fins to dry faster and straighter. Yes, and that's what we that's have what, on the yeah. front. Um, this has a very fine mesh that doesn't, this is perforated, and because it's a fine mesh, it doesn't leave a texture on your fins like some of the heavier uh, meshes do. They can leave a texture if you, if you pin them heavy. So this stuff works really nice. It has kind of a smooth finish. Um, now, You'll see me with these pins. I, want, I don't want this fin to dry off center, doing funny things. There may be a time for that. Maybe you have an action pose that you're trying to create, and there may be a time for that. But I'm sticking it right in through the hoop of my paper clip and down into real close to the body. There is, close to the fin, there is no aren't any scales and you'll find a nice easy place to stick the pin to. Now this is nice and sturdy and it isn't going to move on me. This is kind of fun and we're getting customer stuff done. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. This is good. We're going to have him all pinned up. We'll do three more tomorrow. I mean we'll just proceed around the whole fish the same way. Tom's going to, we've already got these fins fin sets all cut out so they match up pretty nice. They go kind of fast. If you were to have to cut these all um, the first time around, it does take quite a bit more time. But um, now that they're already pre-cut and sized, they just go right on. You can move through the fish pretty quickly. Now, if you trim down your fin bases really well, um, it's possible that you can stretch these over center mm -hmm. so that they're facing forward. And I don't think a fish I know he doesn't want to do it. Maybe he can do it, but uh, be careful that you don't extend your fins too far forward. Yep. Yeah. Um, now I did. I pulled on the front of this spiny dorsal, and then I let it go. So I'm going to grab it again using my finger on the spine. And I might have to come back and get that one with a pin.
sometimes takes about three hands to do this, especially when you're not used to it. And I do pin this heavy. I don't want it to, if I want it erect, I don't want it to fall down during the night. Um, fish fins are difficult for me to rehydrate and move again. Do you need some more clips? I will. There, I got that one. And like you said, you can, that leading edge of the fin is probably the one, the biggest culprit for falling back as they dry. And so if you want to, from the outside, after you get them all pinned up like this, you can slide one of those Euro pins. Um, just the small ones, you've got green ones and orange ones. Just catch that leading edge and uh, put a pin through that. And the that's the nice part of the carding material that is solid, which we put on the back side, is this side will hold pins. This side that is a mesh to allow it to dry doesn't hold pins quite as well. And that's why we don't use two layers of the mesh. We use one solid and we use one of the mesh. Um, the other nice thing about this being solid plastic is the damp fins almost create a suction. They stick to it so you can spread the fins against the solid plastic and, um, and then pin over it and it kind of holds them in place a, a little bit, um, at least while you're trying to get your paper clips on, in place. Now I haven't, um, on my dorsal, I haven't done anything to make sure that it stays online. So you always want to come back. I do um, stick, stick a Euro pin or a little wire or something long. Make sure it's the way you want it. Stick a pin like so, right down through the hoop of the paper clip, through that soft skin, and then one on the front, and that is going to stay nice and in line. Now that's nice and sturdy, nice and sturdy, nice and sturdy. I'd do the same under here. And you just grab the backside paper clip? Um, that's what I kind of, I kind of go through the paper clip yeah. and make that make sure it'll stay there. And now you can bang this around, you can put it up on the shelf and be kind of rough with it. They wouldn't do that, would they? We are. <laughs> no. Okay, now um, I might jump up to those gills pretty quick here. Now here again, these pelvic fins, you want them hugging that underbelly, that chest. So I get my plastic way over to the edge Now you pin to the trailing edge tight to the edge of your plastic, and now you're moving, then you stretched your I stretched leading edge forward. forward. I like that. Like you yeah. said, it does feel like when you first start doing this, it feels like you need three hands, but. Now I can, I can rock that fin back and get it as close as I possibly can to that chest. I'm going to take my Euro pin, stick it along the under a paper clip, and stick it into the soft skin. Maybe. Now, if that stays there, um, it should give you a nice pose. Okay, another thing, I'm gonna jump up. I'm gonna come back and finish those if we have time. Um, another thing, this, this little knuckle of that fin is pulling away from the body. Would you have a 
T-pin, yep. yep. um, leaving an air gap, a little drumming. So I'm just going to take a pin there because a pinhole is instant fix with a little fix-it scope or clay, and I'm going to push that right in there, and that's locked into place. But I wanted to show you on the gill flaps, we also have um, pieces like this. And they're like big commas. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take that big old comma, slide it up under here. Maybe you can look at this from the side. And that gives me something for this, all of these plates to lay on, as well as my bronchioostical rays. And now I can take, I can take big pins if I want to even and adjust the spread of my gills. So I'm going to take a big pin right here, stick it through there, and I should be into my foam body. And because it goes through that plastic kind of hard and firm, I will uh, be able to, it'll hold that plastic where I want it. So something like that. Now, now that spread a lot. I would not like it that much, that spread. So I just push it down that plastic a little bit. And you can, that will control how open your gills are. And I'm going to do it on the back. Try to, try to strive for symmetry. Everything you do on the front, do on the back. Try to have a match. That's your string in it. Oh, yeah. Um, so you don't have, get them wonky. We sometimes get stuff wonky. No. But we try hard. We try not. And your fingers are behind, so be careful. Well, they send you a warning. They bleed a little bit if you get <laughs> too close. Now up under here, when I'm, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to hit nothing but soft skin, so it goes in real easy. Um, I have a little paint on there or something. But they should go into that, there we go, styrofoam body real easy. Now I'm going to look at him, look at him from the front, and I'm going to close that down a little bit. Um, moderate to me is not flared like a cobra. Now I've got a couple fins left. We almost did it. Almost. I didn't think we could. You said we would. I didn't mean it. And while you're pinning that, the one other little thing I'd tell you, when Tom brought these these bronchial ostigal rays down and spread them really nice. Um, they do open up on the bottom. And so if you want to, you can, you can grab, they overlap each other. And when you spread them, they do, they can pull out real wide. If you want to, you can just grab the leading edge of them with a pin and make sure they're overlapped. And then that kind of closes over your, over your uh, throat latch there and makes a nice little transition. Covers left some over of right? That up. Um, right over left? Yeah, something like that. Um, left over right. They're all they're all the, all the same. Kind of like you got left-handed fish and you got right-handed fish. I'm, I've I've never seen the opposite. I've neither. I've neither. Um, they're always the same, but I'm sure there's one out there that's not. As soon as we say that they are. Okay, now check your check your um, pelvic fins for so one's not way up on the side and one's not down funny. Um, you can get them askew. See, that's my big word. There's askew. A, yeah, I was going to say you pick on me. That's a, no, a, I wasn't picking that's on you. I was $3 super word. impressed with your. <laughs> you make us sound really good. And. Oh, you got one to go. One left. One little ratty one. Um, I have my. 
plastic is in the way because it's cut a little bit big. So I'm going to trim that back. And that is just the plastic from the back edge of the gill cover. Just took a little bit off of it. Want to water? Um, it's pretty good, but I will. Um, something else, as you're working on your fish, um, we've taught students how to do this forever. And some of our students, sometimes the girls, are <coughs> cleaner than the guys. <laughs> and they keep their taxidermy work cleaner than the guys. And the finished product is much, it catches your eye. Yes, it does. It's cleaner. Um, so as you're working with clay and working with glues, um, it does tend to get on the fish. And as it does, it works up under the scales and it gives you a lesser product, less, less impressive. I mean, you know, while you're pinning that, I'm staring down his throat and I'm thinking of little things to tell him. Um, one thing that's really important, I'm sure you mentioned several times during the skinning process, but um, before we put the skin on, we made sure and we used the pressure sprayer inside the gills and inside the mouth. And you want to make sure and spray all of that. If there's any residual slime or anything left in there, you want to spray it all out before we start mounting. Um, that can leave odors and, and kind of undesirable. That's the, that's the one thing that you really want to make sure. We did mention rinsing off the skin, but also rinse and blow out the, the gills. Now also, we made that nice throat in there and we have teeth hanging down. And so before you affix the mouth, it would have been nice, there we go, to pin those teeth to the roof of the mouth. There, there is like his crusher teeth. Kind of little te tooth pads. And by poking that up into the mouth, it, it takes your tooth pads up in the top of the mouth. Um, and now, if you look down in there, there's a pretend throat in there. Looks pretty good. And then stand back and look at him at a distance. Um, a lot of times you work on them and you can't quite see um, what you got going. Stand back and walk around him. And that's about that's it. it. I think we'll probably... Um, that's a real good seam. Your seam is about as tight as you're ever going to get they came, it. They came together pretty nice. Okay. And our giveaway. We got a giveaway. We do. We are giving away the fin carding system and the winner... And wait, 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 what do they get for the fin carding system? They get... They get... A roll, <laughs> a roll of, uh, of the solid, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And they get sheets of this. Yeah. And they and get... Paper clips. Paper clips. And I believe some pearl-headed pins. That's uh, a deal. Pearl-head pins. Um, pretty much everything they would need to do what Tom just did um, other than the Euro pins. Those and are remember, pins. don't throw these away. Um, once, once this fish is dry, pull all your pins apart, put them in a you know, safekeeping to use the next time, and take all of your, leave your paper clips right on. Those, that plastic will slide right off that fin. Leave it on, put it in a big baggie, label that big baggie, whatever kind of fish it is. Yeah. And um, I used, uh, what, what did it say, eight, eight pound, pound walleye? walleye and we used every one in the bag. Yep. And we always have a little extra here in case there's one missing. Um, but it's great stuff to work with and you never have to buy it twice. Yep. Only once. They'll like it. And who is our winner? Our winner is Tanya Messerly. And Tanya won by liking and sharing last week's live video. So nice. congratulations, Tanya. Make sure to like and share this video to be entered in our giveaway for next week. Good. Hope, I hope we taught you something or taught you what so. not to do, <laughs> yeah. one or the other. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, um, what will we do next week? Oh, man, I bet we better start finishing. They're probably getting bored with we this. Better we better put him in fast. front of us. I know. I know we're on five. It's going to be 15 more, and we should be done <laughs> with this fish. Uh, Thanks a lot for joining us, and see you.